Good morning. morning. And welcome to worship at Glebe St. James United Church in downtown Ottawa on the second Sunday of the Easter season. If you are visiting or a newcomer, we extend a special welcome to you. Friends, take note of who is seated near you and offer assistance if needed. There are green cards near the entrances and at coffee hour. If you want more information about Glebe St. James, fill one out and pass it into the office. My name is Marcia Hay Snyder and I'm a member of the Church Council. Glebe St. James is an affirming community of faith in the United Church of Canada. Everyone and their gender, race, ethnicity, abilities, sexual orientation, or religious affiliation is welcome and celebrated in our worship. If you don't experience being welcome, please let us know and we'll do better. I have one announcement this morning. Hold this date. At 3 p.m. next Sunday, April 14th, 2024, Glebe St. James will host a workshop called Why Does My Voice Wobble? Choral Singing and the Aging Voice. This workshop is for anyone who enjoys singing, not just people who are in choirs, but who are noticing changes in their voice as they're getting older. There's no minimum age requirement. And if you don't have, and you don't have to be in a choir. There are lots more announcements. If you haven't had a chance to read them yet, they can be found on the church website and scrolling on the sanctuary screens at the end of the worship service. Today's worship service bulletin can be found on the Glebe St. James website. On the website, you can also find a link to this week's announcements and a donate button to make your offering. If you're here in, in person, you can share your offering in the service, either in the collection plate or via e-transfer. And now, let us listen to Ross Snyder make our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land where we gather today in worship is traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We recognize the two closest Algonquin First Nations communities, Kitigan Zibi and the Algonquins of Pequa Kanagan. We offer our gratitude for their stewardship of the land and water, the plants and the animals through many generations. When I realized that I knew almost nothing about the Piqua Kanagan, I turned to their website for information. There I learned that the Piqua Kanagan First Nation is located on the shores of Golden Lake, about one and a half hours west of Ottawa. One of their current priorities as a community is to create a land use plan for their reserve. Another is to address addiction and mental health issues among the people who call the reserve home. I look forward to increasing my knowledge of the concerns and hopes of these people on whose land I live and to find ways to be a better neighbor.
Would you join me in our call to worship? And for guests, everything you need is on the screen. In the presence of Creator, we gather this day in the spirit of gratitude. Gratitude for all the creatures that walk swim or fly or crawl on the earth. We gather seeking wisdom to help us live together with respect and humility. We gather as children of Creator and bless our place in creation. Creator, we give thanks for the knowledge you give us through the indigenous cultures of the world. Help us to honor the gifts that each offers. We give thanks for the East, for the sun that rises to begin each new day. We give thanks for new life, for youth. We give thanks for new learning and new experiences. We are mindful of young parents without safe places to raise children. We're mindful of youth without safe places to live. We give thanks for the South, for the growth of summertime in our lives, for the teachings to be kind to ourselves and others. Help us who are elders love and respect children and youth. Help us to care for the elderly and those who cannot care for themselves. We are mindful of seniors and elders without safe places to live. And we give thanks for the West, for the understanding of how to care for the earth. Creator, help us to use this understanding to bring joy and new life to the world. We are mindful of adults struggling to keep a safe roof over their head. And finally, we give thanks for the North, Help us to receive the gifts of wisdom and new perspectives from all peoples. Help us to grow our roots of compassion deeper as we journey. May we who have the luxury of homes help those who do not.
We invite the kids to come forward if you'd like to come join us at the front. I need my mic too. Thanks. Hi, welcome. Would you like to come join us at the front? You're welcome to come sit with us. We have kids to come to. Hello, welcome. <laughs> oh, I like your hat. <laughs> that is awesome. You have an awesome hat. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're going to do introductions this today in the theme time. I'm going to show you how indigenous people say hello and uh, the questions that they ask each other when they meet. And so, do you want to ask the questions? Sure. What's your name? My name is Reverend Dr. Teresa Burnett Cole, but my indigenous name is Gnandam, and that means clear mind. I know, all right? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> very apparent all the time. <laughs> and where are you from? Um, I was born in London, Ontario, and I was raised in a little farming community named Mount Bridges. Mm. And who are your people? Well, that's a bigger question, because on my dad's side, my people are Mohawk, uh, which is part of the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquoian Confederacy, and his family comes from the Tyendinaga territories down near Kingston. My mom's people are Irish, really, really Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they're from London, Ontario, originally from Londonderry in uh, Ireland. So now, Sue, what's your name? My name is Susan Toller. You gotta walk into the camera. <laughs> Susan Toller. Well, who are your people, Susan? My people are from the Ottawa area on my father's side. They're even a bit on the Quebec side near Fort Collunge. And my mother's side of the family come from Bowmanville and then Toronto. And uh, who are your people? My people from both sides of my family come mostly from England, a tiny little bit of Scotland that my dad always used to get excited about, but mostly from southwestern uh, parts of England around Devon. Cool. So we're going to turn this into a family affair, and uh, I want you to turn to someone uh, and ask them those three questions. And in case you're not sure about the questions, we made it easy. So let's give it a try and uh, greet someone uh, in an indigenous way. Let's go about it. Mm.
All right. Just another minute and we'll pull you back into the service. Well, that was a success, and I'll bet you know things about people you never imagined. Let us pray, and then we'll go uh, into, uh, into Sunday school. So, it's a repeat-after-me prayer. Dear God, Dear God thank, you for thank you for friends. Thanks for family. And thanks that we have strong roots. All this we pray in Jesus' name. And let the people say, Amen. Amen indeed. It's time for Sunday school. Today's reading is from Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. This is a story of a Samaritan village who refuses to receive Jesus in the First Nations version. His work on earth was coming to an end, and Creator sets free, Jesus, would soon be returning to the spirit world above. So he drew strength from deep within and made up his mind to go to the sacred village of peace, Jerusalem, and finish what his father sent him to do. He sent some other messengers ahead to High Place, Samaria, to find lodging, but the people of High Place would not welcome him, for they knew he was on his way to the village of peace, and they wanted nothing to do with the people there. When he takes over, James, and he shows goodwill, John, found out he was not welcome there, they said, Wisdom Keeper, do you want us to call down fire from the spirit world above to burn them up? like the prophet great spirit is creator, Elijah did. Creator sets free, spoke sharply to them. You do not know what spirit you are listening to, for the true human being came to help people, not hurt them. After that, they walked silently with him toward another village. As they traveled on, a man walked up to creator sets free. Honored one, he said, I will follow you wherever you go. He answered the man, the foxes live in their holes, the winged ones who fly above us live in their nests, but the true human being has no place to lay his head. Creator sets free, turned to another man and said, come, walk the road with me. Honored one, he said, let me first go home to my father until it is time to bury him. Let the ones who are dead bury their own dead, he said to the man. You are alive, and go tell others about Creator's good road. Another said to him, Honored one, I will walk the road with you, but first let me go home and prepare my family. 
Creator sets free, told him, no one who begins a journey and then turns back is ready to walk Creator's good road. This is wisdom from our ancestors in faith. So, I grew up in a village in southwestern Ontario. The closest thing we had to a homeless person was old Johnny. Now, old Johnny lived in a shack behind Mrs. Glover's house. It was pretty ramshackle and run down, and we couldn't play over there. That was clear. As I prepared this service, I've been thinking about John extensively over the past few weeks. I don't know whether John was indigenous. It doesn't matter. He had a job, he was the local dump man, and he often hauled bits and pieces of refuse home with him. I remember John because he was an outsider. And I had a sense as a child that there was something off about old Johnny, something just a little bit dangerous. I didn't think of our village as racist, though I did think there was a particular pecking order in the largely em immigrant community, and it went like this. Dutch, Portuguese, British Isles, everybody else, and then the Indians. There were a couple of reserves nearby. Now, I had grown up and moved to London when my parents decided to sell the house and move. And I don't know all the ins and outs of the sale, but to make a long story short, my father decided to sell the house to an Indian couple from one of the local reserves. It was the late 80s, but no one would give this couple a mortgage. It isn't easy to finance off-reserve housing because Although you might well have owned your home on the reserve, the land is owned in common, and you can't sell it to just anyone, only to another band member. This young couple was stunned when my father offered to hold the mortgage himself. It was his way of balancing the odds just a little bit. Now, I doubt at that time he ever explained his indigenous heritage, he just quietly put his thumbs on the scale of justice. And then I remember moving to Toronto and being shocked by the high number of people who were homeless. I lived near the Friendship Center at Spadina and Bloor, 
And indigenous people always hung out there. I, I remember I used to see regulars on the steps to the church. And I often felt paralyzed by guilt when I walked by them. However, truth was, I was a university student and not far from homelessness myself. These people formed my concern for homelessness. Old Johnny, that young couple starting out, and the people on the steps of Trinity St. Paul's United Church. Homelessness is a really tricky word for many of us. Some might feel guilty because we know that in our community, we do encounter people who are homeless. Now others might feel angry because we just don't solve the problem of homelessness better as a society, and it's not fair. Still others might at times feel indifferent towards people living with homelessness, thinking the poor should just get their act together. Still others might feel unaffected by the issue, believing that our taxes are related to such problems and that the government should take care of these people. But here's the thing, anyone can become homeless. In 2021, 11.2% of Canadians, that is almost 1.7 million people, admitted that they had been homeless at some point in their life. That's a huge number. The Homelessness Hub estimates that at any given time, Canada has between 150,000 to 300,000 homeless people. And why the high fluctuation? As many as 50,000 people are couch surfing or staying with friends. And often, women find other ways to get out of the cold. What we do know is the number of unhoused people in this country is really high. Now, what about Ottawa? Well, the most recent statistics for Ottawa were gathered in, Ottawa, or in uh, October of 2021. And every night, here in Ottawa, over 2,000 people stay in emergency shelters. Now, note that our family shelters are 35% over capacity. We actually have a waiting list to access emergency shelter, let alone housing. Besides the 55% who were lucky enough to get a bed in an emergency shelter, 13% were in transitional housing, 11% stayed at somebody else's home, 9% were on the street, 6% were in uh, treatment centers, jails, or hospitals, 3% weren't sure where they were going to stay that night, and 2% were living in encampments. That's Ottawa, folks, that's home. And you know what? We're about average for a city. Drilling down still deeper, what about indigenous people? Friends, 32% of people experiencing homelessness uh, identified as indigenous. And I, I wanna put that number in perspective because you see indigenous people only make up 4% of the population in Ottawa. 40% First Nations, 34% Inuit, 15% Métis, and the 11% uh, uh, remaining having Indigenous ancestry. Yeah. One more interesting little statistic that talks a bit about family breakdown. Of the 428 Indigenous people who responded to this uh, survey, a full 42% had been in foster care. 42%. Although the root cause is poverty, the truth is people become displaced or unhoused or homeless in all kinds of circumstances that they don't choose. Maybe it was rooted in uh, violence or perhaps abuse at home, so they distrusted the world from an early age. Perhaps they were born gay or queer to families who viewed them as outcasts, so they were literally thrown out. 
Others were forced from their homes by natural disasters, like fires, or they were uprooted from their homes and never able to rebuild. Or maybe they're jobless, not because they're lazy, but because they have no legal documents for employers to hire them. Or perhaps, and this is becoming more and more of an issue these days, perhaps they're uh, underemployed or working below the table. Many are dealing with an array of health conditions, chief among these chronic diseases, physical disability, substance abuse, and mental health issues. And finally, learning or cognitive limitations. This shouldn't surprise any of us. According to the Raising the Roof website, approximately 235,000 Canadians will experience homelessness each year. The number of homeless people and the length of time they spend homeless just continues to rise. In today's gospel, we see Jesus, James, and John preparing for a journey towards Jerusalem. Jesus was searching for hospitality in a Samaritan town and didn't find it. No one offered Jesus a place to stay. And James and John's, John, if you recall, were so angry that they wanted to punish the Samaritans. They wanted to rain fire down on these people and have them consumed. Yeah, that's a little intense in my books. But Jesus, no, he wasn't flattered at all. In fact, he was very upset with his disciples' reaction. He would told them before and he'd tell them yet again that if people didn't listen, if they would not welcome them, just shake the dust from, that, uh, from their feet and move on. And so they did. You know, Jesus talked about the radical demands of discipleship. And in this story, Luke introduces us to three would-be followers who seem genuinely interested in following Jesus. The spirit, uh, there's a spirit of urgency that invades these, these stories. Follow me, Jesus says, now. No if, ands, or buts, now. For the Luke and Jesus, it is definitely now or never. So let's, let's take a look at these three followers, starting at the last. The third would-be follower has important business to wrap up before he can follow Jesus. He wanted to go home, say goodbye to his loved ones. And what is wrong with that, you may ask? In light of the immediate mission ahead, the sending out of the disciples to different villages, for followers to go home will mean they will miss out, though their request might seem reasonable enough. If you're looking back, Jesus says, you can't plow a straight row. That's a brutal response, but having watched farmers, it's true. If you're looking backwards, you're not going to have a straight row. Unless maybe you use GPS. Yeah. I guess when your face is set to Jerusalem like Jesus, it's hard to be impressed by even excellent excuses. Jesus spots a second person. Hey there, let's go. Follow me. And the person doesn't say no. He just had something else to do first, which was important. Let me go and bury my father first. And in that ancient society, as it is in ours today, burying one's parents was a solemn obligation. It was a part of obeying the commandment to honor your father and mother. So who can blame this person? I mean, I'd do the same thing, wouldn't you? The second follower continued to reason, I have responsibilities to bury my father. I'm not free to follow you right now but I will follow you immediately after my father is safe and secure six feet underground. Jesus' answer again seems harsh, one that's hard to understand. It seems to run counter to family responsibilities. He says, let the dead bury their own dead. 
But you go anyway and proclaim the good news. What on earth does Jesus mean by those words? I like how American writer Nancy Rockwell interprets it. It's a, uh, she says, leave him. Let those with no vision of the future bury him who has no future. This phrase implies that we should spend our time and energy on living people, not dead people. I could make an argument that a funeral is for the living, but apparently that's a parsing that Jesus didn't do. And then there's the first pop follower. He says, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Sure, Jesus answers. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have no home. I have nowhere to lay my head. I am a homeless man. Any bed I have is because someone else lets me use theirs. Are you still interested in following? Life will not be comfortable when you follow me. There'll be challenges along the way and difficult choices. And you will stumble and fall and be homeless, hungry, and lonely. That's your call. I have a sculpture on my desk, and it's a miniature of a bronze sculpture called Homeless Jesus. And it was created by Toronto sculptor Timothy Schmaltz in 2013. It depicts Jesus as a homeless person sleeping on a park bench. And his face and his hands are hidden under the blanket, so you might not know it's Jesus at first. But then you see the wounds in his feet that reveal his identity as the crucified Christ. And Schmaltz has described it as a visual translation of the scripture, whatsoever you do to the least of these, you did to me. Now, reactions to the sculpture were quite intense. Some people were incredibly provoked, others were uncomfortable, and others thought it was offensive, maybe even blasphemous. A couple of cathedrals rejected the sculpture uh, uh, about Jesus. Um, they thought it was too inflammatory. Um, then it was installed at Regis College in Toronto. And what I love about the irony of that is that it's kitty corner to the Ontario legislature. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many politicians walk by it on their way to work, and do they even notice it? Fourteen years later, that homeless Jesus bronze sculpture has found a home in more than 100 places worldwide. In each place, he challenges the complacent, the wealthy, the powerful, and us in both heart and mind. I've placed my miniature on the coffee table in Fraser Hall, so you can get a closer look at it if you'd like. Jesus held nothing back when he said he was a homeless man. He placed himself with the displaced and uprooted, those with nowhere to lay their tired bodies or wearied souls for comfort. What seems to be true for indigenous homeless I knew the streets were often better than the homes they left. But here's the thing I've come to believe as truth. People experiencing homelessness have been disconnected from their social networks, from the loving relationships that we all need to survive and thrive. So many people at risk need the support of caring people. It's easy to see the problem if you drive through the low-income areas of our city. But what about here in the Glebe? Have you noticed the young couple sitting on Bank Street? Or another old Johnny who sleeps in a blue tent in our vestibule? Friends, we cannot solve homelessness by ourselves. We need partners, faith communities, civic organizations and groups corporations like the ones who partner with MHI, governments and individuals. Now I know that many people in this congregation support women's shelters, 
the mission, Operation Come Home, and Habitat for Humanity, to name just a few of the local outreach charities. Some Glebe St. James people walk in the Tulipathon annually to help raise funds for rent subsidies for clients of MHI. Others work towards eradicating homelessness by working towards a guaranteed livable income. Still others volunteer at soup kitchens, food banks, and missions. Multi-faith housing has an ambitious plan and they're going to raise 1.6 million for this new indigenous housing project. Now that number sounds mind-blowingly big until you factor in all of the churches that could be involved in raising those funds over an 18-month campaign. The question for us is, what are we willing to do here at Glebe St. James? Now, we've made an initial contribution with this service and its recording that will be shared uh, throughout our region. But are we willing to set a fundraising goal to help them out? That's what's being asked of, of the churches. And if all the churches across our region were to contribute something, well, I believe that 18 months is a reasonable amount of time to gather those funds. In reality, stories of homelessness don't have happy endings unless we step up and do something about them. But Jesus said it so himself. He was a homeless man. It's a story that bothers us, but here in the Gospel of Luke, it won't go away. So how do we respond? You know, there are so many homeless people in our communities that need our immediate attention. They might not be sleeping on the front steps of our church, but they roam our communities and streets of affluent neighborhoods. They're also outside the doors of Canada in countries where life and humanity are taken for granted. As followers of Jesus, God calls us to respond with love and justice. And in doing so, we may find someone who doesn't look, smell, or speak like us. And that someone, my friends, might be the homeless Jesus in disguise.
have my mic. All right. Well, I have the honor of introducing Suzanne Lee, who is the um, executive director of Multi Faith Housing, and she's going to tell us a little bit about this interesting new project. I'm going to go through really quickly in um, a fast 101 on Multi Faith Housing Initiative who we are and what we're about. If I can get the next slide, please. So Multi-Faith Housing Initiative came into being in 2002, and we worked together with all the different faith groups in the city of Ottawa to address this issue around housing and homelessness. But I tend to see our organization as more than just a housing and homelessness organization. We are about working with communities to build community. We are about working with faith groups to build community. You have to have a membership. Today, um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Today, we have about um, 80 faith groups across this city who are members with us between um, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, Baha'i, Unitarian, all who take out memberships with us and then work with us to address this issue that Reverend Teresa spoke so eloquently about during her, um, during her sermon. Can I go to the next slide? Multi-Faith Housing Initiative has been working with the United Churches in Ottawa, specifically, have a very long history as very early supporters of our work, and when having Ann Squire as the, one of the very first patrons of Multi-Faith Housing Initiative. In that history, we have built a number of units, and our most recent, well, one of our more recent builds was a 98 home community in Barhaven, of which the United Church was able to fundraise $100,000 towards offsetting the cost of that construction, but also in allowing us to build a community room where we do a lot of community programming. When our tenants come into us, they're coming to us from hard backgrounds, homelessness, um, uh, mental health issues, addictions issues. We have people coming to us out of the prison systems. So when they come in, having those access to um, homework clubs and nutrition classes and sometimes just coffee classes and knitting and crocheting, all of those things that make a community is really, really important to their ability to succeed and their ability to rejoin society. So the United Churches uh, their, the United Church's campaign to raise that $100,000 enabled us to set aside that space and let that community happen. Further, we had the, the next one we had was our United We Stand campaign that happened with all the United Churches in the Ottawa um, Regional Council, and that was um, for, the, for our Veterans House project because we then started a whole, whole we actually started a whole separate charity to create housing for homeless veterans. And when we speak of homeless veterans, it's also important to note that 35 to 40% of homeless veterans living on our streets are indigenous. So it all feeds in together. In that campaign, the United Church committed to $150,000. However, we were able to leverage that $150,000 commitment of the United Church and get matching contributions. And at the end, we fundraised the United Church Church has fundraised over $380,000. Can we go to the next slide? So that $380,000 lets us build a 40 unit city supportive housing community on the former Rockcliffe Air Base. 100% of our tenants came to us out of the tent communities, out of the shelters, out of their parked cars and they moved in, and in that community, it was really important to have full wraparound social services and supports to make sure that our tenants were able to learn how to live in housing again and be able to succeed. We'll go to the next slide. And we'll, I already spoke about that one, so we'll go one more. The final campaign that I want to talk to you about is this one that we're starting right now is the United We Dream. And this is for our Dream Le Bretons. This is our next big project that's very exciting. It is 133 units. Of note, we are setting aside 30 units 
for homeless Indigenous families and people. Reverend Teresa spoke to you a lot about the stark, and they're very stark, statistics of homelessness in our city and what that looks like to the Indigenous community. The important thing to note about that is that we have been given a gift, and that gift is that we can do something about it. We can build. Now, doing something is hard, and it's expensive. Construction is very expensive. But once we build it, these units will stand long after all of us have moved on. Long after we're gone, those buildings will stand and they will continue to serve family after family, generation after generation, in order to help solve and address this issue around housing and homelessness. The only way we can do this is by working together. So if we go to the next one, I'll talk a bit about the United We Dream service package that has been put together in partnership with Reverend Teresa, which includes music, sermons, and even a prayer reflection is available to any minister and any church in the United Churches who want to pick this up and run a service. And we're asking every United Church in the Ottawa area and the Ottawa Regional Council to run a service for the, this campaign. And that service is available on, on the um, uh, Multi-Faith Housing Initiative website and also yours own website. And what you see in front of you is the picture of the two big towers we're building. I think I want to mention one last thing on that tower and that on those towers, and that is we are part of a bigger project, which is a total of 608 units in partnership with a market developer. That has allowed us to get down our, our cost per square foot. $1.6 million is a lot of money, but $1.6 million for 30 units, think of how much it costs to buy a house today. If you were to go out there, it's actually really good value for money. We've been able to, to stretch it with government funding, funding and everyone's support. But we are going to be running our community engagement programs that makes us very unique in the housing sector. We're going to be running it for all 608 units so that we're able to foster upward social mobility and give everyone the opportunities that they need. So I wanted to, that's all I need to say about that. I wanted to end my whole um, talk today with, oh, you, I should mention you can donate online and you can also donate in all the traditional ways. But I wanted to, to finalize by saying I wanted to give a little gift of tobacco in appreciation to, to Reverend Teresa, in appreciation for all you have done in support of Multi-Faith Housing Initiative and helping us address this issue around Indigenous housing and homelessness because there is no way we can address this if we're not doing it together. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the gift of tobacco and I will uh, return it to the earth in a good way. Um, out in our medicine garden afterwards. So now is the time when we reflect a little bit on the blessings we've received and also on the fact that we've been called to share the good news of God's love. We've been called to share our resources of time, energy, prayer and money in ways that enable us and others to continue the ministry that Jesus began. Let us present our offerings.
Let us pray. We give these gifts freely, and we receive these gifts from you gratefully. We dedicate these gifts to the work of our congregation, serving human wholeness, caring for our planet, upholding religious freedom, welcoming the stranger, loving one another. Amen. Our prayer response today, O oh great spirit, how we long to hear your name. In your part, how we long to see your face. Gentle God, grandfather and grandmother of us all, help us to see that we see, that we touch what we touch is sacred, it's holy, that the ground upon which we walk is holy. O oh, great spirit, how we long to hear your name. Holy One, help us to imitate the sun in warming our sisters and brothers, the birds and the trees whose secret is peace. Help us to be like the spring wind which does not destroy what it touches. O oh, great spirit, how we long to hear your name. Great spirit in the circle of friendship, in the sharing of support, in the strength of companionship, your presence is made real. Help us be present to those who need to feel your love right now. In particular, we hold up to you our indigenous brothers and sisters, those on the streets, those in shelters, those in transitional housing, those precariously housed, and those just making ends meet. O oh, great spirit, how we long to hear your name. How we long to see your face. God, may we have the eyes to see the reality of your presence, ears to hear your authentic call, hearts to understand your way of justice and hope. May we struggle with solidarity that is real May we enter into relationships that open and stretch us. Bless our journey in which we dare to hope and grow. O oh, great spirit, how we long to hear your name. How we long to see your face. And now we lift to you all of the prayers hidden in the wordless places of our hearts as we pray the prayer that our sibling Jesus taught us our mother and father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Just before I do our benediction, I'll let you know that there is coffee uh, to be had down the hall. Uh, if you're not familiar with our church, come up the front aisle, turn this way. Yes, I am channeling my inner flight attendant. And you're gonna go through a set of doors that's right there, walk straight down the hall, smell the coffee. You'll be fine. May our footsteps on these ancient lands remind us of creation and connection in our search for truth. May the pine tree with its roots to its branches remind us to dig deep and reach high in our actions for justice. And may the eagle who soars in the sky remind us of the power in our call to love. And may the expanse of the lands and the seas, of the sky and the stars, remind us of God's timing in our faith in hope. Return now, my friends, to the circle of life, knowing that the love of the Creator is with us, the compassion of, the, of Christ inspires us, and the hope of the Holy Spirit comforts us. And let the people say, Amen. Amen.